So now I'd like to introduce Linda, uh, who needs no introduction. She's going to discuss the 16th Congressional, ADA, ADAO Congressional Staff Briefing. That briefing is on asbestos. Uh, I don't remember the entire title. Oh, here it is. It's the impact of asbestos on public health environment and economy. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. Um, this is a unique opportunity. And Dr. Oliver, you did a phenomenal job. I'm sure they're gonna be calling you and giving you a SAG uh, card soon. Just so you know. Um, can I start, stay on player A gang, technical gang? Okay, great. All right. So that being said, um, I am that girl that uh, hasn't given up just like Julie and Connor and Dr. Oliver and so many others. So when we talk about art and advocacy and shared stories, that is what ADO has done for 17 years. We have taken our stories. Who didn't cry when they watched Connor's film and or heard Julie speak? I mean, our stories are very powerful and very important to be heard, felt, shared and remembered. So taking the stories that Doug and I first started with our, when we started ADAO, storytelling, digital storytelling was really important to me. So we built a whole website, we have over 200. And then we do our staff briefings as Dr. Oliver knows, cause she has, she's helped with them. We take our stories. And if you're from Missouri and you're a Missouri lawmaker comes, we make sure they're introduced to Julie, Connor, and Zach. If you're from California, you get to learn about Alan and many others. So we take our storytelling and really magnify it from a lawmaker's perspective. So we talk about art advocacy and and uh, shared stories. I am so passionate about this. It's how I've lived and breathed for 17 years, but I also see that we need to do this as, as you've heard from filmmakers. So because of COVID, uh, we were working on our 16th congressional staff briefing. If anybody's ever Washington, you will know those staffers work so hard for their bosses. We can hear all the stuff on the nightly news and I, I, it makes me upset. Asbestos has been seen initially before we really got our you know, work going as a Democrat versus Republican issue. And then thanks to Senator Merkley, Representative Bonamici, Chairman Pallone and Representative Slotkin, we were able to bring a bill forward in the 116th Congress, which means it actually was introduced in 2019. We went so far and had a landmark hearing in the energy and commerce and it actually passed out by a vote of 47 to one. And that was really a high point for me personally, because that showed we are able to go through those barriers where it's just Democrats and Republicans. It's not, it's people. So our briefing in August, I built on what had happened in Congress. And when we lost the opportunity to take our bill to the floor, but we have members that stand by the bill and you'll hear good things tomorrow. But um, we did that staff briefing and I wanna look at my slide because I haven't had much sleep lately and I don't wanna have a, have a whoopsie-daisy as we call it in our house. So the <laughs> briefing was our congressional staff briefing and the title was called The Impact of Asbestos on Public Health, Environment and Economy. And there were 10 experts that were going to talk to staffers and bring in our different areas of expertise. And at that briefing, when we put out our invite, it was Dr. Brad Black from Libby, Montana, Dr. Barry Castleman, amazing expert witness, Dr. Raja Flores, who was in Connor's film, Dr. Arthur Frank, who is distinguished professor Drexel, Amazing. Brent Kynock, abatement specialist. I mean, he, he does great work. Dr. Richard Lemon, former assistant surgeon general. Dr. Uh, Celeste Monforton, who is amazing with APHA and labor. Love her. Greg Russell from the International Association of Firefighters. Doesn't get better than that. I should probably shouldn't say that, but I, the firefighters are hugely important to ADO. They were at our first conference. And then, of course, Bob Sussman, who is counsel for ADAO, basically does pro bono. Uh, he believes in our work. He believes in the issues that ADO tackles, and he is a gem of a So we set up a briefing. It was virtual. And because it was virtual, and I did it on Zoom, I thought, well, hey, I could record this and then share it another time. Because let's face it, how many people want to sign up for a Zoom briefing? Not too many. But 
You might watch it when you're riding your Peloton instead of Cody. You might just watch it when you're watching or listen to it when you're walking your dog. I can't compete with Cody on Peloton, but it was a, I knew it would be a really important briefing. So we recorded it. That being said, the next 45 minutes, and if you have to go someplace, take your phone. You're going to want to hear these experts talk about the latest facts and stats. You're going to want to know that when Dr. Oliver presented at the staff briefing, she was equally as impactful. This was our 16th staff briefing. We have more in the works. And for those people, who our ADO leadership, our volunteers, our donors and supporters, and sponsors, you allow us to take education to a, to a new area. The ripple of education is undeniably powerful and we're not, none of us are giving up, none of us. So I'd like to introduce this uh, staff briefing. We did not record any staff questions. I wanted to maintain the integrity of our briefing and make sure that the staffers who would listen and then report back to their bosses, write a memo, could have the comfort and trust in me that they could ask honest questions, like some that you heard from Dr. Oliver or, or Julie or Connor over the day. So what you're going to see is the presentations only. Uh, we did not use PowerPoints. Death by PowerPoint point is just too much these days. But take a watch and let me know what you think. And maybe you want to share the briefing with your members of Congress, which we will make possible. Good afternoon, this is Linda Reinstein and we are delighted to have you join our 16th uh, ADO briefing. And we're going to bring you all of the information that will hopefully help you and your boss see the need to ban asbestos and how this issue impacts your constituents in your district, in your state and throughout the nation. We normally have a robust uh, briefing in person, which is just terrific. We get to see you uh, and have that conversation and answer all of your personal questions. But obviously with COVID, that is not an option for us. So we want to make sure this is a safe briefing and we can bring you all of the information. Uh, we, I'm going to just start a, a brief PowerPoint that will give you the visuals uh, that also make it a little bit easier. This will be the only PowerPoint that you will see. Uh, we are going to be talking about the impact of asbestos on public health, the environment, and economy. Uh, this is obviously, this is not the first time we've had this conversation with staffers and members. So we think that it's, it's, it's really time to circle back with some of the new papers, studies, and facts and stats that make your memos to your boss even easier to write. Today, you're going to hear from experts totaling over 350 years of experience. You can see that there are 10 of us that are going to bring you the information. Dr. Brad Black from Libby, Montana, sends his regrets. He's unable to join us, but I believe Dr. Frank can bring in some of the information that Brad would have um, spoken about. Uh, for those of you who haven't met either me or anyone from the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. We are an independent nonprofit. We've been doing our prevention and policy work for 17 years. And we believe that with prevention and policy, we can eliminate all asbestos caused diseases through education, advocacy, and community support. Today on the briefing resource page that you will have a link to, you can see the myriad of different studies and papers and resources. We want to make sure that this is an easy page for you to access. Um, and you'll see everything from the EPA's uh, recent final risk evaluation to uh, studies and reports, which we think is very helpful. And uh, we're happy to be a resource after this briefing. Uh, ADO always dedicates our work to an individual. Today is no different. We're dedicating this briefing to Mike Mattmuller. He fought a very courageous mesothelioma battle and he passed away last year. He was only 38 and leaves behind a young family. Uh, and it is tragic because obviously mesothelioma is a pre preventable asbestos caused disease. How do we talk about asbestos when we're in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere? This slide gives you the opportunity to see how small these nearly invisible fibers are compared to grains of rice and human hair. 
we're talking about asbestos today, we're going to be using the AHERA definition that will, the term asbestos combines all six fiber types, which our experts can touch on. But I wanna make sure that when you go back to your office, you can see the definition that is being used within um, bills that we work on, as well as EPA risk evaluation and other agency rules and regulations. And in closing, when we're, Dr. Frank is gonna pick up with the health issues, but I want you just to take a minute and look at this slide. So each year, over 40,000 Americans die of preventable asbestos caused diseases. You may only hear about mesothelioma, which is a tragic disease which claimed Mike's life and also my late husband, Alan's. But I want you to look please at the lung cancer and other cancers caused from asbestos exposure. We can do more, we can do better. And with your help and your boss, we can work in this session of Congress to truly ban asbestos. So with that, I'm going to ask that um, Dr. Frank, you're up next uh, to start your presentation, please. Thank you, Linda. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Arthur Frank. Uh, I'm an occupational physician by training. I also hold a PhD and worked for a number of years at the National Cancer Institute, uh, studying the effects of asbestos on tissue. Uh, and my work in the field of asbestos started more than five decades ago in 1968 when I began work with Dr. Irving Selikoff, who's well known in the world of asbestos disease. I've been associated with Linda and ADAO since the year of its founding in 2004. I had the privilege of knowing her husband, Alan, before he passed away. And Alan is only one of many, many thousands of individuals literally around the world that I have gotten to know that have developed mesothelioma and asbestos-related diseases. As Linda said, uh, we still have some 40,000 deaths per year in the United States, and this is not a new problem. Uh, in 1898, we had the first significant literature in uh, the United Kingdom uh, on the hazards of asbestos. Uh, and literature has been building up for more than 120 years now, documenting the hazards of asbestos, causing asbestosis, which kills people, uh, the scarring of the lung, plus the cancers Linda mentioned, as well as other cancers uh, that weren't on her list, gastrointestinal tract cancers, kidney cancers, and uh, oropharyngeal cancers. There are two families of asbestos. Uh, it's a, a naturally occurring mineral fiber. It's not made by man. Um, the amphiboles have five members. Uh, the uh, one member of the serpentine form, chrysotile, represents about 95% of all the asbestos ever used in this country and literally around the world. And now over 60 countries in the world have banned the asbestos, uh, the use of asbestos, the mining of asbestos. Uh, literally just yesterday, I heard from a colleague in Brazil that the courts there reaffirmed that. Uh, and a number of us on this call uh, were uh, part of the effort in Brazil to get it banned as we are here trying to get uh, the Allen Reinstein ban asbestos now bill. The other two materials that we're concerned about occur in Libby, Montana. In addition to asbestos in the vermiculite mine there, we have winchite and richterite, sometimes called the Libby amphiboles. And Brad Black, who uh, runs the CARD clinic, the Center for Asbestos-Related Disease, uh, uh, unfortunately couldn't join us, but I've been to the CARD clinic. I've examined Libby-exposed individuals, and we're ta not talking just about workers, but their family members. And many, many of the 12,000 people that live in uh, Libby. Uh, it's a ubiquitous uh, material in that community. So as uh, you consider the uh, banning of asbestos here in the United States through the Arban uh, bill, uh, it's imperative that uh, we join the rest of the civilized world in doing this, that we use the AHERA definition as Linda had up, uh, because the science supports that and the Libby amphiboles uh, and I thank you for uh, hearing me out about the uh, medical hazards of asbestos and the uh, preventable disease it's caused here in the United States and around the world. And let me now introduce uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Raja Flora, as a 
eminent, preeminent cardiothoracic surgeon at Mount Sinai, which is my alma mater. Raja. Thanks, Arthur. Can you guys see me? Yes. yes. Sorry for the technical difficulties, Raja. All right. So um, misinformation results in death, whether it's from COVID or whether it's from asbestos. And 20 years ago, when those towers came crashing down, misinformation spread just as fast. Lies such as the air was safe to breathe, asbestos levels were negligible. And the biggest lie is that asbestos was banned in the United States. Whether this misinformation was for political gain or monetary profit, I don't know. The facts are the air was not safe. Asbestos levels were dangerously high and asbestos is still not banned in the United States. Since that dreadful day, approximately 2,600 more deaths have occurred over the past 20 years and counting. First responders continue to die and this is unavoidable because of their heavy exposure. But what is avoidable is the continued exposure of innocent Americans to asbestos. Asbestos continues to be imported. It contaminates gaskets, friction products, brakes, roofing materials. It also contaminates children's makeup and crayons, and the list goes on. The truth is, is that asbestos is still not banned in the United States, and it continues to be imported. Legacy asbestos, still lives in the walls of many of the New York City buildings, including public housing. And every once in a while, an unsuspecting construction worker, fireman, or tenant becomes exposed to this hidden, deadly carcinogen. But this life-saving information about asbestos not being banned in the United States is not nationally known. Many are surprised when they find out that asbestos continues to be imported, that it is not illegal, that asbestos is still not banned in the United States. There are those who profit from this misinformation and pe people continue to die from this misinformation. American politicians have chosen to look the other way. Mesothelioma is a deadly cancer from asbestos exposure, and I cannot look the other way. It is a disease that I battle with every day in the operating room, cutting out cancer-ravaged lungs and other body parts for a disease that is 100% preventable. No asbestos, no mesothelioma. It is that simple. Congress, you know what's the right thing to do. Ban asbestos today and stop the continued death and suffering of innocent Americans. You can save more lives with the stroke of your pen than I can with the cut of my scalp. Wow. Dr. Flores, thank you for that passionate appeal, which we look forward to circulating this video. Celeste? I think I'm supposed to go next. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yes, you're right, Richard. Sorry. My name is uh, Richard Lemon, and uh, I'm a retired former assistant surgeon general of the United States. And I first began working with asbestos around the same time Dr. Frank did. And I was assigned with the Public Health Service to the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, which was created in 1970. And in that position, I started studying asbestos in great detail. And what our findings showed us was the dangers involved with asbestos and the numbers of people and workers being affected by exposure to asbestos, so much so that it became the very first recommendation our institute made to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, for control of asbestos in the workplace. At that time, we did not recommend a ban, but we did say that the only safe way to work and uh, deal with asbestos 
is was to limit exposure and have no exposure. But as we went on doing our research, in 1976, we found that much of the earlier information which had come from the British government was flawed. And we reevaluated this information and came to the conclusion in 1976, the only way to stop asbestos related diseases was to ban its use in the workplace. Thus, NIOSH became the very first agency of the federal government to recommend a ban of asbestos. We have continued to, the Institute has continued to recommend a ban on asbestos. However, we said that if a ban could not be achieved in some conditions, then it should be brought down, exposure should be brought down to the lowest concentration that could be measured in the workplace. And at that time, that was 0.1 fibers per cc, an amount of asbestos you cannot see. But we went on to say that we still considered that a ban is the only way to protect workers and our citizens, because we know that the workplace walls are, do not stop exposure. As workers work with asbestos, they oftentimes carry asbestos home on their clothing. And in that process, they expose their family members. We have good scientific information that family members of asbestos workers do indeed develop the asbestos related diseases, including mesothelioma. And we know that people that live around waste dumps, hazardous work, uh, areas or even next to factories where the asbestos is not controlled also develop asbestos related cancers. I uh, just finished a paper which was published uh, last week on the risk to sailors. And the interesting point about sailors is that sailors work and live in their uh, workplace. They're there 24 seven, seven days a week. So when we talk about controlling asbestos in the workplace based upon an eight hour uh, uh, PEL or permissible exposure limit, it's not gonna be effective for people that live and work in their workplace. And I'd like to say that as Linda said in the beginning and others have said, we still have 40,000 deaths occurring a year. It is widely accepted by the scientific community and by both the national and international public health authorities that asbestos causes increased rates of mesothelioma, lung cancer, laryngeal cancer, ovarian cancer, and other asbestos related diseases. Therefore, it is not surprising that there is a consistent evidence from multiple epidemiological studies that asbestos related disease is still with us today. There can be no doubt of the causal relationship between asbestos exposure and subsequent increased risk of asbestos-related diseases. Some 70 countries have banned asbestos in our world, but the United States is not one of them. We implore you and ask you to ban asbestos in this country. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Celeste. Dr. Celeste Montefort, uh, Celeste. Thank you, Dr. Lemon, um, and thank you for allowing me to participate. I am Celeste Montforton, and I'm a lecturer in public health at Texas State University, and I'm a member of the American Public Health Association. And APHA is an organization that combines 150 years of perspective with a broad, diverse membership and all of us speak out for public health issues and policies that are backed by science. Asbestos is a potent carcinogen and it poses a grave risk to public health. And in 2009, and again in 2019, APHA adopted formal policy statements calling on Congress to ban the manufacture, sale, export and import of asbestos. 
Asbestos cannot be used safely. And so the first line of defense is stopping its use altogether. We must also address the tens of millions of metric tons of asbestos that is already present in communities because it was used so extensively in construction materials and in commercial products. In APHA's 2019 policy statement, we urged Congress to mandate a comprehensive national assessment of the presence of asbestos in residential, commercial, public, and school buildings. And this is so important because we cannot protect the public from exposure to asbestos. If we don't have accurate data on where it's located, what condition it's in, how many people are exposed, and how it is handled and disposed of. Such information through this national assessment would be particularly important for communities that already experience health inequities because of their income, their race, or their ethnicity. And for individuals in certain types of jobs like firefighters and building maintenance staff and workers and volunteers who respond to the destruction of homes and businesses and buildings following extreme weather events that we are seeing so much. So on behalf of the American Public Health Association, we are urging Congress to take swift action to ban asbestos and to have, uh, have a national assessment of its presence throughout our country. Thank you for listening and I'll turn it over to Brent Kynock. You're muted, Brent. Brent. I'm sorry, I'm unmuted now. Hi, thank you, Celeste. Uh, my name is Brent Kynock. I am the Managing Director of the Environmental Information Association, or EIA. EIA is a group of professionals who are involved in the um, detection and removal of asbestos from buildings uh, in the United States of America. Uh, we represent, uh, as part of our membership, uh, everything from uh, uh, consulting firms who test for asbestos to laboratories who analyze those samples, contractors who remove the asbestos, training providers who train workers and supervisors, and equipment suppliers as well. Uh, one of the things that our membership has agreed on for over 10 years is that everyone in our organization supports a ban on asbestos in the United States. Much of what you're gonna hear me say uh, over the next few minutes has already, you've already heard from my colleagues previously. That is that there are over 70 countries in the world who have seen fit to ban asbestos, but sadly, the United States is not among these. Uh, it was over five years ago on June 22nd, 2016, that President Obama signed into law the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act. This was an update, an amendment to the Toxic Substances Control Act. And in fact, uh, asbestos had been the poster child for these updates to TSCA, which gave uh, EPA broader authority to ban asbestos. Yet five years later, we are really no closer to banning asbestos today than we were before these provisions to TSCA were put in place. Uh, what I want to say to you is that uh, our members are dealing with what is known as legacy asbestos or that is those asbestos materials that are already in buildings today. But because we haven't banned asbestos, we continue to put asbestos into our buildings. And we in fact are going to continue the legacy of disease and death that exists today. You've heard about how many people we lose each year related to asbestos disease and uh, 
all of my colleagues on this panel today have had very close friends that we've lost to mesothelioma, to lung cancer, and to other cancers related solely to the exposure to asbestos. It is a preventable disease. You and your bosses have the opportunity to step in and ban asbestos in an area where EPA has not taken the steps necessary to do that. And we urge you, urge you to do that. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn the floor over to my colleague, Greg Russell. Hey, thank you, Brett. My name is Greg Russell, and I come to you representing the International Association of Firefighters, an organization that represents 324,000 uh, career professional firefighters and emergency medical responders that serve in every district of this nation. Our members are on the front lines day in and day out, responding to uh, the citizens in their time of need. We don't have the opportunity to ask questions about our environment. We assess it on the go and determine uh, the level of protection we need and we uh, take action. Um, in our business, literally seconds mean lives. So uh, we generally uh, protect ourselves with uh, what is known as turnout gear, the yellow suits that you see us wearing and um, uh, air masks and helmets. Well, the problem with a, a structure fire or a major incident like 9-11, we're on our, the 20th anniversary of 9-11, is you cannot remain on air, on a, a air tank for excessive amount of time. The, the tank will run out in about 30 to 45 minutes. You have to come off of that air. And even if you are not in the fire facility, or excuse me, the fire structure, whatever is on fire, you are in close proximity to smoke and ash that is falling from the sky on top of you. That smoke and ash is laced with asbestos and other toxins. Uh, firefighters currently are experiencing a cancer-related uh, line of duty death rates of approximately 70% a year, meaning that 70% of our line of duty deaths each year are cancer-related. Um, and if, with, if only 10% of those are um, asbestos related, that is still a huge number over time. We are talking uh, uh, in the area of about uh, 50 firefighters a year that would be dying from uh, asbestos related uh, cancers. So I want to leave you with this. Every day there's a building that burns. Every day there's a firefighter that goes in and puts out that fire. Uh, as he does his job, he, he will, he or she will be exposed to asbestos. It will fall on him. Uh, that asbestos will originate in the materials that were used to build the house from the roofing shingles to the glue that glues the tile to the floor, to the wallboard, to the contents. Anything electronic in a house nearly all has some amount of asbestos in it. Certainly your major appliances are loaded with asbestos particularly your stove. In a major fire, all that gets uh, basically evaporated. The metal shell will be intact, although deformed. All the contents will be vaporized and in the air. That will fall down on firefighters. At the end of the day, we will decontaminate ourselves on scene, but the whole time our vehicle has been sitting there. That uh, uh, asbestos-laden uh, materials has been falling on our vehicles. It has been entering the cabs of our vehicles. It lands on, on our hose. We take all that stuff back to our house, the fire station, um, where we clean it up. Mind you, we don't have the personal protective equipment, the air packs and things uh, that, that we use in our uh, on firefighting. We don't use those in the fire station um, it, because it's impossible to see and determine if asbestos is present. You know, it's in the dust inside our living quarters, in our... Uh, in our kitchens in the fire stations. So firefighters are continuously exposed to asbestos and we suffer uh, mesophilioma and asbestos related cancers at a rate double of the general population. So uh, after that fire, after that building burns in a year, two years, there'll be a new building that goes right back on that piece of property. And today that new piece of, uh, that new building will contain asbestos. 
It is our job. It is our desire. It's our hope that if we ban asbestos now, slowly over the course of time, uh, the number of buildings containing asbestos will shrink and thus the risk to firefighters will be reduced. Thank you. And I want to turn it over to my friend, uh, Barry Castleman. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a public health worker. I've been working on the problem of asbestos for uh, the last 50 years, working with environmental groups, uh, working with government agencies. I've been a consultant to numerous federal government agencies on asbestos in the Congress, uh, to international bodies as well as the World Bank, the World Health Organization, the International Labor Organization, trying to uh, work with people all over the world to bring about bans on asbestos and to regulate uh, the hazards associated with asbestos in place. The only industry importing asbestos fiber in the United States now is the chlorine industry. Uh, asbestos products are imported, and I'll say a little more about that later, but the uh, manufacture of asbestos products in the United States has ended. And uh, uh, the uh, industry that uses asbestos in the chlorine manufacturing process, it's an old process. Um, there are about 10 to 15 of these plants uh, left operating in the United States using an asbestos diaphragm in the uh, chlorine manufacturing process. Uh, and they use 300 tons a year of asbestos that creates hazards for their workers and uh, for the environment that has to, this to, has to be disposed of. The Environmental Protection Agency uh, issued heavy fines, according to the trade press, uh, on uh, uh, such pollution uh, from the uh, diaphragm cell process of chlorine manufacture uh, in 1993. We have not been able to get the records from the EPA about the specifics. About 40% of the chlorine made in the United States still comes from these old asbestos diaphragm plants. Uh, these plants uh, are owned by two or three companies. And as I said, they're all 40 or 50 years old or older. All over the world, safer membrane cell technology has been uh, built. Uh, this uh, is now accounts for 83% of all the, all the uh, chlorine produced worldwide. Uh, and uh, all, almost all the plants that have been built in the last 40 years have been membrane cell plants that don't have asbestos or mercury in them. Uh, also, non-asbestos diaphragms have been developed for plants uh, that use asbestos uh, so that they could replace the asbestos and still have the same basic uh, uh, process of manufacture. And this has been implemented uh, in, in a number of places all over the world. It's sold in the United States. Uh, the, uh, uh, the improved product has a better performance, a longer service life, and uh, less energy consumption than the asbestos diaphragm process, and it pays out in four years. So the cost of implementing the non-asbestos diaphragms in place of asbestos in these plants would pay for itself in four years, but that is not sufficiently fast for industry to have adopted this technology on its own and so it really cries out for government action to, to force the uh, replacement of this antiquated, discredited technology uh, of asbestos with uh, safer materials. Um, the uh, substitute materials are, are fibrous, but they're non-respirable. The fibers are too large to be breathed into the respiratory tract, and there's no reason now to be particularly concerned about them as a health hazard. Uh, I have tried to press the chlorine industry in the United States to disclose its progress and its ability to replace asbestos in these plants. And, uh, uh, and I sent comments that I had sent to the EPA to the asbestos, I mean, to the uh, uh, Chlorine Industry Trade Association, um, uh, whatever it's called, the ACC today. And the woman representing the chlorine industry uh, for this trade association uh, after receiving my comments that I'd sent to the EPA about substitute technology, refused to talk to me about this at all. Uh, I wanted to ask about the progress of our, our companies in replacing asbestos, and uh, the queen of chlorine at the ACC was unwilling to answer a single question. A ban on asbestos would force the industry to replace discredited hazardous asbestos technology and protect public health and the environment. In addition, 
uh, a ban on asbestos in the United States would block the continuing imports of asbestos products, uh, even though we don't make things like brake linings and, and uh, gaskets uh, in the United States, they continue to be imported uh, from countries that use asbestos, uh, some of them under barbaric conditions, no doubt. And we also import 50 to 100 tons a year, according to import statistics, of asbestos yarn and thread from Mexico. And uh, so far, my pleas to the EPA, our pleas at ADAO, have uh, not uh, gotten the EPA to go and track down who the US importer or importers are for that asbestos yarn and thread and what kind of occupational, environmental and consumer hazards might arise from this, this, this material being used in some kind of manufacturing process in the United States. So uh, uh, I just want to uh, urge you to uh, catch up to countries like uh, Croatia and Colombia that have banned asbestos uh, it's really a disgrace that the United States doesn't have a ban in place. Um, and so now I turn this over to uh, Bob Sussman, a former uh, distinguished lawyer at the EPA who retired and now is our lead counsel in uh, uh, the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. Yeah, thanks, Barry. And uh, good, good to be here today too, uh, to talk about banning asbestos. I'd like to provide some broader context on asbestos regulation in the US and why uh, asbestos ban legislation is essential after many years of waiting for EPA to ban asbestos administratively. As you heard from Dr. Lemon, calls to ban asbestos date back to the 1970s when the public health community and government experts recognize the compelling scientific evidence of the hazards of asbestos and the mounting toll of disease and death linked to asbestos exposure. In the 1980s, EPA mounted major effort to restrict the use of asbestos under the Toxic Substances Control Act or TSCA. EPA did succeed in issuing comprehensive regulations in 1989, banning most uses of asbestos, but unfortunately, they were overturned by a federal court in 1991. And for the following 15 years, there was no federal regulation of asbestos use under the TSCA program. This changed in 2016, when Congress strengthened TSCA, and as a result, asbestos came back on EPA's screen. The agency listed asbestos as one of the first 10 risk evaluations under the new law, and EPA completed its asbestos risk evaluation at the beginning of this year. However, there were many shortcomings in the EPA risk evaluation and it was criticized by many independent scientists and the agency's Science Advisory Committee on Chemicals. I, I won't go all, through all the deficiencies in the, the EPA uh, evaluation, except to mention that the evaluation failed to consider the risk of legacy asbestos, which as you've heard, remains in place in tens of thousands of structures across the country. Having completed the risk evaluation, EPA is now moving into risk management rulemaking with the goal of regulating the asbestos uses that it found to present an unreasonable risk to human health. We don't know how this process will turn out but we have a lot of concerns that it will not produce the outcome that all of us have been hoping for. It will probably take a number of years for EPA to issue a final rule. And then that rule could be challenged in court, just like the 1989 ban. The effective date for the reg regulation will likely be several years down the road. There's no guarantee that EPA will ban all or even some of the asbestos uses it's targeting. 
And then, as Barry said, these uses may not turn out to be the full universe of current asbestos uses and would exclude prior asbestos uses that might return to the marketplace in the future. Finally, the EPA risk management rulemaking would not include legacy asbestos uses since they were not included in EPA's risk evaluation. Because of these concerns, it's simply not prudent to sit back and rely on EPA to ban asbestos. That's why an asbestos ban should be a top priority for Congress, which can cut through the administrative process and stop imports and use of asbestos on a fast track. ADAO is, is working with uh, Senate offices to introduce an asbestos ban bill on a bipartisan basis, and good progress is being made on a discussion draft that might be ready for introduction in September. We are hoping for a bill which is written to eliminate the commercial production, importation, and use of asbestos. Uh, there are also concerns about asbestos contamination uh, of certain cosmetics uh, and consumer products, but the expectation now is that these concerns would be outside the scope of the legislation. This would enable us to, to maneuver around the naughtier definitional issues, which complicated enactment of asbestos ban legislation in the last Congress and stick with the established definition of asbestos that Congress adopted in the 1986 Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act. The legislation would also jumpstart EPA's evaluation of the risk of legacy asbestos by requiring the National Academy of Sciences to conduct an in-depth study of these risks. Finally, the bill would put in place comprehensive reporting requirements so that we can finally obtain reliable information about how and where asbestos is used in the United States and who is exposed. To summarize, only Congress can rid our society of asbestos once and for all. And we are hopeful about the prospects of asbestos ban legislation in this Congress. Thank you. Now I turn it back to Linda Reinstein. Thank, thank you, Bob. So in closing, I just wanna circle back with some of the facts, stats, and things that we've discussed. When you write these memos to your boss, it's complicated. We are so respectful of the many deadlines and demands that you as staffers and your boss face. We wanna make this process easy and complete. Last year in 2020, over 300 metric tons, 300 metric tons of raw asbestos were imported by three U.S. companies from Russia and Brazil. Barry's already told you that safer substitutes exist. You've heard from every distinguished speaker and especially Dr. Raja Flores, who has the daunting task of trying to save a life after somebody has developed mesothelioma or another type of asbestos caused cancer. We want to be that resource to you and your boss. We want to make sure that the misinformation and disinformation ends today. It must end today and the experts stand ready to help you as you move forward. There are two quotes from every speaker on today's presentation. They are all in your staff resource document and I'll send them by way of email. If you have questions, there are nine of us on this, on this Zoom call. We're happy to take them individually. So at this moment, I'd like to thank our presenters. Everyone will stay online. I'm going to stop the recording so you as staffers can ask questions and get an honest answer. That's what the asbestos disease awareness is all about, is honesty, honesty, honesty trans, uh, transparency, and of course, action to protect public health and the environment. 